Good morning. Good morning. Golly. It's nice to be here. Here's looking at you. I want to thank Colleen one more time for, well, maybe one more time, at least again today for stepping up last week and playing and, and uh, did a great job. Sounded wonderful. So I won't ask you to give her a hand this time. Oh, you can get it on your own. Yeah. Anyway, thank you very much. We need the Lord, don't we? Lord, I come to confess, bowing here, I find my rest. Without you, I fall apart. You're the one who guides my heart Lord, I need you Oh, I need you Every hour I need you My one defense My Steep, your grace is more where grace is found, that's where you are, and where you are, Lord, I am free. Holiness is Christ in. seems like today more than any other time we need you we need you to intervene on our behalf personally so that we walk a straight path and exemplify the your goodness and your holiness in our lives and our nation needs you real badly lord and we don't do this very often but i just offer up this prayer lord for for our government for civility in this nation. We see, a, we see a snowball starting at the top of a mountain and growing and growing and growing in incivility in this country, Lord God, and danger. And we just ask, Lord, that your hand would be upon those who believe and trust you and that you would turn the hearts of those who don't know you to the solution of crying out to you. We ask for peace in this country as we've established peace in other places. 
We ask for peace in this country, Lord. We ask for safety for our police officers and for our countrymen. We seek you, Lord. You are the only one that can intervene on behalf of the faithful, us, who will pray. And we call out to you today for that, Lord. We pray this prayer once again, Lord God, that you taught the disciples, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. In heaven it only goes his way. faithful. Bless our nation. Bless our families. Bless our loved ones. We trust you in these things, precious Jesus. Amen.
without the piano. I love to tell the story. I'll sing this theme in glory and tell the old, old story of Jesus and his love. Amen. We do that in different ways at different times. Sometimes somebody will ask us, why do you believe? And you know that it just avails an opportunity for us to say why, or how did you come to believe, uh, or what can I do? I feel so lost. <laughs> well, that's a fair question. And uh, I was found, and you were found, when we came to know Jesus because he loves us so much. And there's an answer to that that's a simple answer and not a, not a difficult answer, but there's an answer to that that each one of us can give. And I'm not trying to turn you out there as preachers. I'm saying as we walk and live our lives for Jesus, hopefully people will ask us what, what makes the difference in your life. I had one young guy years ago at the facility, and he told me, uh, he said, I came to... I came to believe when I was in youth, he was in the youth jail prison. I came to believe because I noticed the other guy had some peace and I wanted that. Okay. So he got answers and he found the Lord. Amen. And just imagine you're standing. Holy, holy, holy. This is a picture of the throne of God. A picture of the throne of God with all of the created creatures surrounding and worshiping him. And it's what we're in store for. It's a description of every living creature worshiping God, our creator, at one point. Every living creature. Yeah, pick your battles, grow good kids. Yeah. You know, we get busy. All of us do, I do, we all do, and we forget the greatness, the glory, the, the, the story that's unfolding and, and, and that's described in Revelation, and I'm not going to end time stuff with you, but how Jesus is the one who, the only one who can un open up the scroll and and say this is, uh, it, it's, it's finished, really finished, and it's really begun all at the same time and call all the saints to heaven. And there's peace and the earth and, and the heaven come together and become one new heavenly place for us to live. And it seems a far away from, from us. I mean, I, because we're dealing with the day to day, I still have to go to work Monday, you know. <laughs> You understand? Or tomorrow, or today, actually. But I don't want, I don't want the starfish to out-worship me, so I'm going to work at it a little bit harder. Amen? Okay? Okay. All right. Well, one of the readings for today, and I was going to have some fun with it, but we'll just, we'll just read it and smile as we go. <clears throat> Jonah. Our buddy Jonah. And Jonah, I've heard preachers say Jonah was a racist. Oh, well, I don't know about that. You can't read his heart by his, by his attitude or his behavior this way. He was definitely strong-willed. Jonah, 3.10 through 4.11. When God saw the people of Nineveh, He saw what they did, how they turned from their evil ways. God changed his mind about the calamity that he had said he would bring upon them. We got to set this up, though. Jonah's told, go to Nineveh and preach. And Jonah kind of says, yeah, okay, and turns, turns his back. And if you don't know the story, you, you probably do. But he jumps on a ship and tries to go elsewhere. Well... God sends a storm that's, that's sinking the ship if, if they don't do something about it. And the sailors on the ship are smart enough to know that the one guy downstairs that's, that's not panicking is probably the cause of it. So they confront him and he says, yeah, 
just throw me overboard and, and, and you guys will be okay. I've, I've run away from God and he's, he has sent. So they throw him overboard and, and the, the squall, the white squall that they're going through is suddenly gone and a big fish, but well, you kids know this, the little ones know this, swallowed up Jonah, swam him to Nineveh, to the shores of Nineveh and puked him out. Vomited him out. Thanks anyway. So now God's got his attention and he's like, okay, all right. So he walks across this, this country that, that of 120,000 people preaching and 120,000 people come to know, the, come to Jesus. They come to, to God. Jesus isn't around at the time or isn't known. The king says, I believe and they're going to believe. They all repent and, they, and, and, and they're saved. So, here we are. When God saw the people of Nineveh, how they turned from their evil ways, God changed his mind about the calamity that he had said he would bring upon them. He was going to wipe the place out. But this was very displeasing to Jonah. And he became angry. And he prayed to the Lord and said, O oh Lord, is not this what I said while I was still in my own country? That is why I fled to Tarshish at the beginning, for I knew that you are a gracious God and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and ready to relent from punishing. You're just going to forgive them anyway. It really bothered him. Now, I think there are reasons, there are reasons for that that don't make him a terrible guy. And now, O oh Lord, please just take my life from me, for it is better for me to die than to live. And the Lord said, Is it right for you to be angry? And then Jonah went out of the city, and he sat down east of the city and pouted. He made a booth for himself there, and he sat under the shade, waiting to see what would become of the city. And the Lord God appointed a bush, and he made it come up over Jonah to give him shade over his head to save him from his discomfort. So Jonah was very happy about the bush, but when dawn came up the next day, God appointed a worm that attacked the bush, so it withered. When the sun rose, God prepared a sultry east wind, and the sun beat down on the head of Jonah so that he was faint, and he asked that he might die again. And he said, it is better for me to die than to live. What a powder, I will tell you. But God said to Jonah, is it right for you to be angry about the bush? There's God asking the same question twice, not changing the words of it, but asking the same question twice. And Jonah said, yes, angry enough to die. Grow up, Jonah. Then the Lord said, you are concerned about the bush for which you did not labor and which you did not grow. It came into being in a night and perished in a night. And should I not be concerned about Nineveh? that great city in which there are more than 120,000 persons who do not know their right hand from their left and also many animals. Jonah, I don't know. I have met plenty of stubborn people and uh, even in the face of... He's not a person of no faith. He can preach for three days walking across a country and 120,000 people are saved. So this is not a stupid person, but it sure is a stubborn person. And there's plenty to conjecture about him. Um, there's something called universalism. And, uh, and that is the belief that Everyone's, everyone's going to heaven. There's either no heaven, so there's no, no sweat. Just do your thing. Or everyone's going to heaven anyway, so don't bother me. Don't bother me with all the, you know, living my life this a right way. So universalism is what that's called. It's been around since 1700s. And uh, that's sort of, sort of the way that, that Jonah is behaving here like, well, you know, it doesn't matter anyway. Even though he knows that he's been called to preach and he goes and he preaches and people come to him. So 
Jonah's a mystery to me. I don't think he's a racist as such. I just think he's a stubborn guy. I'm, I'm all ears if anybody has an idea of what this man is about. The second reading we'll look at today is from Philippians 1, 21 through 30. <clears throat> Paul tells the people of Philippi, he says, for me to, for to me, living is Christ and dying is gain. Paul had seen the third heaven or, you know, which is above the sky. So the, the actual heaven that's there, he had been privy to that and wasn't able to, to describe it very much. God had told him to stay quiet about this because it's mysteries and, and we'll know when we know. But he was privy to that. So for him, that was going to be a very nice place to be. He could be there with Jesus and the angels and, and all of this was done with and that the thorn in his side, which was either his blindness or something else, the, the, the thorn in his flesh that made life a little bit more difficult for him and all the work of walking here and walking there. Between the two, heaven looked pretty good to him. For to me, living is Christ and dying is gain. <clears throat> if I am to live in the flesh, that means fruitful labor for me. I can finish my job here. And I do not know which I prefer. I am hard pressed between the two. My desire is to depart and be with Christ, for that is far better. But to remain in the flesh is more necessary for you, the people that I'm serving. Since I am convinced of this, I know that I will remain and continue with all of you for your progress and joy in the faith so that I may share abundantly in your boasting in Christ Jesus when I come to you again. Only live your life in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ, so that whether I come and see you or whether I am absent and hear about you, I will know that you are standing firm in one spirit, striving side by side with one mind for the faith of the gospel, and are in no way intimidated by your opponents, for them, this is the evidence of their destruction, the fact that you have confidence, but of your salvation. And this is God's doing. For he has graciously granted you the privilege not only of believing in Christ, but of suffering for him as well, since you are having the same struggle that you saw I had and now hear that I still have. What does it mean to live our life in a manner worthy of the gospel. He gave us three or four subtexts on that. We would each answer that question a little bit differently based upon our strengths and our, our life, that what it is to, to live our life in a manner worthy of the gospel. And it's it's a broad and big answer and we would all have our little piece. We would each answer that little, a little differently, each with our specific piece of the truth of Jesus' broad teachings. Paul the Apostle highlighted the following. One, stand firm in one spirit. Be guided by the one spirit of all truth, the Holy Spirit who tells all of God's children the same truth and doesn't make anything up or contradict Jesus. Jesus said, I will send the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of truth. And then he said, he will take what I say and he will tell it to you. John 16, 15. Jesus said, the Holy Spirit will take what I say and he will, he will tell it to you. He will remind you of that. That's what the Holy Spirit does. He reminds us of what Jesus has already said. So standing firm in one spirit is acknowledging the one truth of God's goodness, God's nature, and God's authority. It's less likely that we will split hairs over nonsense and split into competing factions and lose sight of our calling when we stand firm in one spirit. The second thing, striving side by side with one mind for the faith of the gospel. Side by side, lifting one another to be their best. Finding our strengths and availing ourselves in community of faith. And I believe we do that right here at this little church. And third, 
in no way inhibited by opponents or adversaries. For them, this is evidence of their destruction. <clears throat> the boldness to believe and defend what is true, i.e. our faith, is the hot coals upon the head of those who ridicule or oppose the truth. When we can do so calmly, when we can stand boldly for, for the Lord, and I don't mean argue with people, I mean stand boldly in our faith, even when people are coming at us and, and prattling about their stuff. When we can stand boldly, calmly, and kindly, and the unbelievers can see that they can't sway us, they're more apt to consider the truth that sets us free and gives us that confidence and that hope. And the fourth thing is, indeed, this is God's doing. <clears throat> the gospel reading is from Matthew 20, 1 through 16. We can stand for that. <clears throat> Jesus said to his disciples, The kingdom of heaven is like a landowner who went out early in the morning to hire laborers for his vineyard. After agreeing with the laborers for the usual daily wage, a denarii, he sent them into the vineyard. When he went out about nine o'clock, he saw others standing idle in the marketplace. And he said to them, you also go into the vineyard and I will pay whatever is right. So they went. And when he, when he went again <clears throat> about noon, to three, uh, about, I'm sorry, about noon and it ended about three o'clock, he did the same thing. He said, whoever's here, go and work for me and I'll pay you whatever's fair. And then at about five o'clock he went out and found others standing around and he said to them, why are you standing here idle all day? And they said to him, because no one has hired us. Now, kind of put that in, this, this parable is, you know, why haven't you come to, to believe in Jesus? Nobody's told me about him. Oh, because no one has hired us, he said to them. You also go to the vineyard. And when evening came, the owner of the vineyard said to his manager, call the laborers and give them their pay, beginning with the last and then going to the first. When those who, who hired about five o'clock came, each of them received the usual daily wage. That's people that just came into the heavens. The, the thief on the right side of Jesus who said, Lord, when you come into your paradise today, or to, when you go into paradise, remember me. And Jesus said, today you will be with me in paradise. He was saved in the last hour of his life. He's at the front of the line here. Those who were hired at five o'clock came in. Each of them received the usual daily wage. They got the same, the same salvation you and I will get. Now, when the first one came, they thought they would receive more, but each of them also received the usual daily wage. When they received it, they grumbled. I deserve more. They grumbled against the landowner saying, these last worked only one hour and you have made them equal to us. Oh, not equal. Equal to us who have borne the burden of the day in scorching heat. Equal to us who worked so hard as Christians in this, in this life. <laughs> but he replied to one of them, friend, I'm doing you no wrong. Did you not agree with me for the usual daily wage? Take what belongs to you and go. I choose to give to the last the same as I gave to you. Am I not allowed to do what I choose with what belongs to me? Asked and answered, yes. Or are you envious because I'm generous? So the last will be first, and the first will be last. The Holy Word of God. Lord, I thank you for that scripture. It, as you know, it's been a great blessing to me, and it's a great blessing to anyone who comes into your kingdom wishing that they had done it 30 or 40 years before. Bless us in these understandings, we ask in your precious name, Jesus. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. I want to tell you, two scriptures that really were helpful to me, <clears throat> many were. One was, many of the first will be last, many of the last will be first. Now, I didn't care about being first, but I was sure glad to be counted among, the, among those who had already been at it for a while. Okay. And the other was, he utilizes the, the 
he utilizes the foolish people uh, to, uh, to reach the, the oh so smart. So he, he utilizes the foolish things of the world, which meant that, you know, uh, even a fool like me uh, meant something to him. Those were important things to me. Many of the first will be last. Many, many of the last will be first. Many of the first will be last. It's a joy to see the underdog prevail. The problem with competition is that someone loses or else no one wins. Now, Parker here, he outruns all the women that he runs in competition with. And uh, that's good, Parker, for now. But competition is necessary for humans to accomplish some things. Vaccines. We're going to have a vaccine pretty soon because companies went, yeah, and jumped on it. They're competing to see who can come up with it first. It's working. It fuels motivation. It spurs creativity. And it can also turn men into self-centered, narcissistic prigs, like the people in this story. Why are they getting what we're getting? It's the tonic of winners and the poison of the downfallen. Water is necessary for life, but people drown in it. Fire is great for heat, but people burn to death. Wind lifts the airship high and blows ashore, destroying people's property and killing innocents. And competition is the same. Competition grows us, but it can also turn us into ungodly people. Preoccupation with another person's gains is always the recipe for failure, as is described here in this scripture. As for ill-gotten gains, God even knows what to do with that because... He makes the sun and the rain fall on the wicked as well as the holy. God knows what to do with an evil person's millions, billions, or trillions. He makes it trickle down into the pocket of the Christian or the believer or the other person that he loves to sustain them. How are you going to argue with that? <clears throat> Preoccupation with someone else's stuff, privilege, or supposed better life, is coveting and we're told to not do it. And I know I'm preaching to the choir here, but there are people out there that need to hear this. It's an insult to God, our fair God, who gives us to us all what is fitting and on time. Remember David, King David, who was such a great guy, but also a wayward guy. And God said to him, I gave you your master's house, made you the, the king and his wives with it in the kingdoms of Israel and Judah. And if, it, and if that was not enough, I would have given you more. That's what God said to him after he had misbehaved with Bathsheba and murdered her husband. It's interesting how much more we have when we learn to rejoice in everyone else's gains. Only then do we realize how very, very much we have been blessed with and how very, very little we actually need. In this story, God illustrates that there is no pecking order in heaven. We are as precious to Jesus, our Father, the Holy Spirit, as anyone before us. All the people that, that, have, that have blessed us with their faith, blessed us with their messages, and I, I gotta, I'm telling you, God, sur God surrounded me with or put me in the path of giants when I was in Los Angeles and when I came here. People who taught me so much I could not have learned as much elsewhere or from more humble people. He did that for me. And they deserve a better seat at the table than I. But according to the Bible they don't get one. God is above all things and above all things fair. He illustrates this in the parable of the workers. Heaven is one big neighborhood, no zoning, no redistrict, redistricting issues. It's one big neighborhood. Answering the question once and for all when Jesus said, love your neighbor as yourself. Remember, the lawyer asked, but who is my neighbor? Far as the eye can see in every direction and then some. We all meet as equals at the foot of the cross. Amen? Amen. Lord, we're grateful today to be together.
here loving you, Lord, worshiping you, being encouraged by these, these truths that you preserved for us through the work of your disciples, apostles. We thank you. We thank you for this little church, Lord God, that you have seen fit to keep our doors open and to give us this wonderful, small faith group. And, uh, you know, our doors are kicked open wide, Lord, and we thank you that you make room in our hearts for others who would come and join us, who also need a place of faith with people and uh, independent people who also love deeply. And so we thank you for those that you will send, those that you have sent, and those that you have sent elsewhere for to be a blessing where they are. Bless our families, look after our loved ones, and thank you that you are the God in charge of all things. Whatever we mess up, Lord God, you've already seen it, and you're working out a way for us to, to prevail in these things. Be glorified, Lord, in all that we say and do. Be blessed. Teach us to worship you every moment of every day, Lord God. And we thank you for these things, precious Jesus. Amen. We'll take up a, an offering. And, um, I think it's, I think the prevailing um, wind is <clears throat> that it's not a great idea to have our, our fall supper. Is that... Yeah. Yep. Yep. And uh, um, we don't we don't hold our hand out so much for things, and we don't and there's no expectation for anyone to to pony up. But some of us who've been here a little while. Um, what's that? Yeah. And, and you never know, maybe we'll decide to have a drive up so we could, you know, have a dinner to go eventually, maybe in the wintertime when things are pretty boring and uh, we could have a... Sp- Yeah, they called me. I told them to call you. Anyway, then they got... Yes, yes, it did. So, more on that. What I will miss is the fun that we have here serving all these people from all over the place that, that like coming here and fellowshipping with us. We have music upstairs here to, to, to keep them around and, and just... It, it's, a, it's a joyous day and... and uh, So the fellowship is important, but um, you know what? We'll have to make it up on Sundays, huh? Go ahead. Thanks for this little church, and uh, we seek your direction and 
at every turn uh, for running this place and, uh, and uh, making it a, all the blessing that it can be. And we thank you for your promise that you return 10 and 100 fold or overflowing and packed down to those who give with a cheerful heart, Lord. Bless them, we ask. Keep our babies and our children safe and, and our, our adults as well, we ask in your name, Jesus. Amen. You could be praying for Amy. Um, she's, uh, she, there's something going on in her knee to, and, and <clears throat> she hasn't stayed off of it, which, which uh, I would have had her do. So now she's laid out flat and uh, um, probably going to the, <clears throat> to the doctors, definitely going to the doctors uh, Monday. So if you could just be lifting her up and when you think of her, um, and uh, that would be much appreciated. She was here until all hours of the night, getting the Sunday school room together, and she feels horrible that it's not that it's she's not here to do it. But uh, she doesn't belong here. Uh, she had one hour sleep and and woke up miserable. So <clears throat> anyway, please be praying for her. Would you say a prayer? Just thank you, Lord. We lift up Amy to you today. She's such a worker for you and has such a heart for you. And so we just lift her up and ask that you strengthen her, you give her your peace, peace that will help her to rest and recover like she needs to. And just strengthen her, Lord, so she can do your work. We thank you and we praise you for her. Amen. Thank you. Thank you so much. Well, friends, any questions? Anything to add? Big Jim, you got something on your mind? Okay. We're always listening. <clears throat> there is a pot of coffee. Coffee and cold pizza. Stand for this if you're not holding me.
no hiccups. Never, I'll never have the hiccups again. You'll never have an a ingrown toenail. Amen? Amen. Oh, you're going to play too, okay. <clears throat> description in scriptures that I have no reason to believe is allegorical. <clears throat> 